Stanford University. Hand you over to Dr. Drake, who is going to tell you all sorts of stuff that's going to keep your mind absolutely humming for the next rest of your life. So, thank you very much for coming, Frank. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, Lynn. It's fun to be here. I was here last year. I guess you're all different this year. I hope. Well, those of us in the front. Because I'm going to tell one or two of the same jokes, <coughs> jokes again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> it, it, is, it is a pleasure to be here. And Lynn asked me to, uh, in a way, tell you about the history of SETI, how we got where we are, how we actually do SETI. And since I've been with SETI since day one, I've lived through all of it. And I'm, what's going to be today is a sort of a stream of consciousness uh, history of what has happened over the 50 years of SETI. As we just mentioned, April 8th is the birthday of SETI. That's the day the first modern search was started. Uh, notice I said modern search. There were actually searches before 1960, uh, and by some pretty eminent people. Uh, Nikola Tesla, in the late 1890s, searched for signals from extraterrestrials and actually transmitted messages from a Tesla coil transmitter in Colorado Springs, Colorado. It generated thousands of volts, made everybody's hair stand on end, and sent messages out with very high power. And in fact, he, fe he thought he had detected messages from outer space, uh, but he hadn't. He had detected sound, signals, which sounded like signals. They weren't. They were <coughs> natural uh, radio emissions but they sounded like whistles. And in fact, they are the f he actually discovered the phenomena we now study these days known as whistlers, which are low frequency waves which uh, follow the magnetic lines of force in the Earth's magnetosphere. Uh, <coughs> in the early 19, and the 1910s, uh, Guglielmo, Guglielmo Marconi attempted to detect signals from outer space and he listened and listened. Uh, he heard the whistlers also and was impressed, but uh, there was seen to be no intelligent content to the whistlers, and uh, so he decided he hadn't succeeded. Now, both of these did not realize that their experiments were hopeless. There was no chance they could detect signals from outer space because why? The wavelengths on which their receivers worked in those days were so low that they were below the cutoff frequency in the ionosphere, which means that any signal from outer space would have been reflected from the ionosphere, could not reach the surface of the Earth. Well, <coughs> it took really 40 years or more before our technology advanced to a state where we could detect signals coming in from outer space, and indeed from the distance of the nearest stars. The nearest stars like the sun, which are about 10 light years away. And in the late 1950s, <coughs> We crossed a threshold, the first time in our civilization, and I believe it, this threshold has been crossed in many civilizations, the first time when one could detect reasonable signals across the great distances which separate the stars. And by that I mean tens of light years or more. This came about through the construction of large radio telescopes for the first time, and also the development of some much more sensitive radio receivers receivers that were about 10 times more sensitive than the vacuum tube receivers that were otherwise used in those days. When you put that combination of <coughs> uh, technology together and calculated the sensitivity of the resulting instrument, it turned out to be adequate to detect the, the strongest radio signals we were then transmitting from Earth on frequencies which would pass through the ionosphere and reach the surface of the Earth. And so for the first time in our history, it became reasonable to search for extraterrestrial radio signals. We didn't have to assume the existence of a super civilization. We never assumed that. In SETI, we always assume only things we know to exist or are permitted by the laws of physics. <coughs> and so it made sense to search. And so in 1958, 59, we started building equipment, myself and some colleagues, to search for signals uh, from outer space. Now, the paradigm in those days <coughs> was very naive and limited. <coughs> we were looking for planets like the Earth, here it is, where there's going to be life like us, which could manipulate tools, was intelligent, and had the ability to build radio transmitters. 
In fact, to this day, if you're really honest, we don't search for intelligent life. We, we search for advanced technology. Maybe it's made by computers. We couldn't tell. But we're looking for something that transmits or releases enough energy, maybe purposely, maybe just uh, in the process of doing other things, such that we can detect it with reasonable instruments that we can build across the distances which separate the stars. That was our paradigm. And at that time, until this day, <coughs> we th think about what should we search for? What are reasonable ways <coughs> for signals to be sent purposely? Or how, what technologies might be used which would uh, 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 release energy as a side product or a byproduct of some enterprise which we could detect on Earth? And this is still, again, an intellectual game. You're all invited to engage in it. And that back then, <coughs> thought was given to using neutrino beams, for example. But if you know anything about neutrinos, you'll realize they're really hard to generate. And what's worse is they're even harder to detect. They go right through the Earth and out the other side without anything happening. So neutrinos have never been a favorite. Nobody's ever searched for neutrino beams. Maybe that's a mistake. Maybe that's the easy way. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, <coughs> uh, then there's uh, gravity waves. We have gravity wave detectors, but they can only detect gravity waves that are generated by stars going in orbit at high speed around one another. Uh, very hard transmitter for us to build, and for anybody to build. So we don't search for gravity waves. But then there's the electromagnetic spectrum, gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, radio, optical, infrared, <coughs> all of that. And all of that is fair game, because all, in all those cases, one can conceive of transmitters which would send signals which we can detect with our existing equipment. But to this day, <coughs> we have emphasized radio searches, and I'll tell you why in a minute. There is actually a reason for that. And in SETI, you always have to be very careful not to be anthropomorphic, not to do things just, or assume that something's happening in outer space just because we do it, or because we do it well. Just because we can build very sensitive radio receivers doesn't mean Everybody does that, and they'll be sending us radio signals. Maybe they have specially good ra infrared transmitters. And actually, you can argue that's actually more desirable because there's uh, infrared waves uh, <coughs> traverse the dust clouds in the galaxy without being uh, <coughs> absorbed. So anyway, back in 1960, <coughs> because we were a radio observatory, and this was in Greenback, West Virginia, we <coughs> put together an instrument to search for radio signals. It was capable of detecting the signals we were then radiating in the microwave region uh, from the distance to the nearest stars. And we targeted the two nearest stars like the sun, the stars Tau Ceti and Epsilon Eridni. Both much like the sun, both evidently alone in space, which in those days was thought to mean they might have planets. So this was a good place to search. Uh, <coughs> we didn't search for light signals. I should have mentioned that. Uh, light signals are a good sign of the presence of a civilization. And this is the Earth at night, is photographed by a satellite. Looks pretty bright, but in fact the lights here have been enhanced <coughs> in this picture. But it turns out to detect the lights of cities at night require an optical telescope of five, about five kilometers in diameter. And we, the best we've got is right now 10 meters. And right now there are people frantically designing the grid and trying to meet the challenge of building a 100 meter dish for, for, light, uh, <coughs> for light signals, but you really need five kilometers. So this is presently out of reach and nobody with any kind of common sense is gonna search for this. But we did search for, oh, <laughs> this is stream of consciousness. <laughs> Another thing you have to consider <laughs> is um, spacecraft. Should we send spacecraft and should we expect that they are sending us spacecraft? The <coughs> if you go to the science fiction movies, of course, they make you believe that interstellar travel is very easy. You just call up Scotty and say, warp seven, and the time it takes to do a commercial. You're in some other star system. It's wonderful. But <coughs> here you have to take serious respect for the laws of physics, because high-speed space travel is extremely challenging. Our present spacecraft go about 10 kilometers a second in speed. 10 kilometers a second, that's one thirty thousandth the speed of light. 
It takes you a long time, 30,000 years to go one light year. And uh, so to get to the nearest stars, it takes hundreds of thousands of years. And we have spacecraft which have now left the solar system, but they're not going to get anywhere for hundreds of thousands of years. To get anywhere useful, you need to go nearly the speed of light. And to do that, you need propulsion systems that we don't have. But I've shown here the ultimate propulsion system. Here it is, very simple design. It's a rocket that just has two tanks. One has ordinary matter. That can be water. Anything will do. And the other is antimatter, which is matter, of course, where the <coughs> atoms consist of negative protons and positive electrons. And what we know, we, we actually created this in, the, in Slack, some antimatter. And what we know and what was theoretically predicted is that when matter meets antimatter, there's a total annihilation, <coughs> all the mass converted into energy. And so that's the ultimate source of energy. And <coughs> that's a way of making a rocket. Now, when you'd make this, <coughs> um, uh, this fusion of antimatter and matter, uh, the product is actually gamma rays, which of course could heat a gas, but gamma rays are a pretty good propellant too. Now, that may look like a delta to you there. Uh, and that's because, this is, as you can tell, this is a dusty slide. It's a leftover from the era of the Cold War. <laughs> when we were first thinking about this, and we didn't want the Russians to know that it's really gamma rays that come <laughs> that comes out of this. Thing. So there's these mysterious delta rays that come out of here. Uh, there, there are certain technical problems, like where do you get antimatter? You can, you know, it's really hard to do. Uh, and how do you store it in anything? And particularly, what do you make the rocket out of that can simultaneously hold matter and antimatter? And we don't know what that is, but we at least have a name for it. It's called a mutabilium. Uh, and a thing like this can actually approach the speed of light. Uh, and there's been actually detailed designs done, actually here in Palo Alto, back again during the Cold War. A uh, four-stage rocket. This is designed to go seven-tenths the speed of light to a distant world, land, take off and come back to Earth at speed of light and land. Now, why seven-tenths the speed of light? That's the speed at which the relativistic time dilation makes it makes the travelers think they're traveling the speed of light. That is, time has slowed down for them sufficiently that it takes them uh, in their, uh, their watches one year to go a one light year. So that's kind of neat. <coughs> anyway, this is staged to minimize the, the requirement of mass. And here we see it. The, uh, this is with a payload of 1,000 tons. So this is a, a spacecraft that's about the size of a 737 airliner or something like that. And, and the other numbers you see here are the mass of matter and antimatter you need as fuel. And the total is 33,000 tons, so 16,500 tons of antimatter. Well, there's no antimatter mine. You have to make that in some machine, and that will take at least as much energy as is in that. And that's with 100% productivity, which, of course, won't happen. That turns out to be a half a million years of the total electric power production of the United States at the present time. Half a million years. So you have to shut down America for half a million years <laughs> to make this trip. And maybe when you get there, nobody's home, you know? You get back in the spacecraft and you come back home at the speed of light and say, gosh, we're sorry. <laughs> we took some pictures, but all we saw were rocks. <laughs> well, you can <coughs> hypothesize simpler missions. For instance, if you wanted to go to a star 10 light years away, at a tenth the speed of light. So it's a 100-year trip. I don't know if you'd really want to do that. You got a 737-sized spacecraft with maybe 40 passengers in it. A uh, 100-year flight, so most of you wouldn't live to get there. Your, your children, you'd have, you'd have to have children born on board and all of that. And <coughs> it turns out that if you do redo all this equation, it doesn't take nearly as much energy. It only takes 200 years of the total electric power production in the United States to fuel the thing. And by the way, that's for a one-way trip. That's, you don't get to come back. <laughs> You've got to find some nice place to live there. Well, would you want to do that? Right, 100 years in a little airplane watching the same movies over and over, <laughs> eating you know, old sandwiches that they sell you for $6. <laughs> <laughs> and there's one other, <laughs> well, there's one other problem. <laughs> you don't want to go, I can tell. <laughs> the thing is, you'd find people that would want to go. <laughs> There would be people. Who would go? There, there are three. 
You better note who those are because they're. You got some slightly, slightly. Uh, there's, there's one other problem. I, I mentioned ten, a tenth of speed of light, and there's something that in these science fiction nobody ever takes account of, and that is if you're going more than a tenth of speed of light, if you hit a little pebble, the energy release is the same as if that were a, a fusion bomb. You get MC, the MC squared out of, uh, or MV squared over 2 that you get out of that is equal to MC squared over uh, 0.007 MC squared, which is what you get from nuclear fusion reactions. So a, a little pebble like this will destroy your spacecraft. One hit. So it's very dangerous. It doesn't just cost much and take a long time. Cost a lot, but take a long time, but it's very dangerous. And this is one of the uh, objections to the, or uh, possible solutions to the Fermi paradox, which I'll come back to later. You know, why haven't they come to Earth? Well, I just told you why they don't come to Earth. They can't turn off their planet for hundreds of years. And uh, even if they did, the mission would d get destroyed along the way, and it'd be a big waste of time. So <coughs> we searched for radio signals. Mm -hmm. And this is what we used in uh, 1960. This is the team of people who put all this together uh, when we had a reunion about 15 years ago. It used a 25-meter radio telescope at Green Bank, West Virginia. Still there, still operating. Old telescopes never die. They're, they're good. And here's the sophisticated equipment that was used. Uh, four racks of equipment. It uh, constructed a system which could monitor one radio channel at a time, bandwidth 100 hertz. It could be tuned across the spectrum. And it was built specifically for the frequency of the hydrogen line, the basic line of hydrogen <coughs> caused by its hyperfine nuclear transition at 1420 megahertz. Now, why that? Two reasons. One good reason, uh, since it's the fundamental radio frequency of the most abundant element in the universe, it was thought that it might be a frequency where civilizations met each other. There's always this problem. Where what frequency do you look at? And how do you meet a friend in a distant city when you can't arrange to meet them in advance? Well, you don't just go wander around. You go to some prominent, well-known place that you both know of, and that's where you meet. And the hydrogen line is that in the radio spectrum. So uh, that was a good reason for doing that. In fact, that same frequency has been used in almost every search since. Uh, the other reason was that it was realized that searching for extraterrestrial life might be ridiculed or criticized. And this was a, being done at a national observatory, taxpayer payer supported. And we didn't want anybody to say that taxpayers' money was being wasted searching for little green men. Couldn't have that. That would be really bad. And the National Science Foundation would have been really upset. So. <coughs> We put it to made the, th the device for this frequency because then it could be used to observe the hydrogen line from neutral hydrogen gas and specifically the Zeeman effect in the hydrogen line. Well, all vacuum tubes. All but one of you, I think, is so young that you don't realize there was a time when there were no transistors, that everything was vacuum tubes. Well, I don't know. You're Very old. <laughs> Just barely. <laughs> Just barely. <laughs> and there, and there, there was also a time when there were no computers. That's probably big news. <laughs> and there are no computers here. They didn't exist in that era. The <coughs> data was captured on a pen and ink recorder, which is right here. The frequency was selected by a radio amateur receiver, which is up here, because it was easy to put a motor on the tuning dial and tune that way. And for those of you who know something about radio, this was serves as the intermediate frequency system for the the thing, and it listened to one frequency. And just because we were optimists, we had a tape recorder here. Some <laughs> of you may have seen these in a museum. Reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, which was ready to record the voices of the ETs when we found them. And this is what we searched with for 200 hours for two months, starting on April 8th of 1960. Actually, we discovered something the first day, which was quite a shock which is we heard a pulsing sound, because we had a loudspeaker, too, connected to all this. We were really optimistic. Uh, <laughs> and Did the telephone to the White House? No, we, hadn't, we didn't have the White House number ready. We weren't that, that crazy. <laughs> uh, we heard a pulsing sound going, choo, 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 choo. We never heard that before. And we got very excited. And before we could establish where it was coming from, it went away. And we spent weeks looking again at that same frequency 
same place in the same star, Toss Eddie, and <coughs> never heard, we did hear it again later and, and <coughs> determined that it was actually coming from an airplane flying around. And it was evidently a military plane testing a radar jammer and it thought by going to the wilds of West Virginia to be someplace where nobody would ever capture its signal, but we did. Well, this stimulated <coughs> Uh, m about by now, uh, 100 other SETI searches, all similar to this, except with ever improving equipment, particularly receivers which <coughs> uh, receive many more channels, uh, much more sensitivity, and in particular, uh, built in computer hardware and software which searches through the data that flows out of these things for signs of signals. Because by today, our radio systems don't look like this. They have 100 million channels, typically. And you read them out every second. You've got a new data point, 100 million data points a second. And there just aren't enough students in the world to go through all this stuff <laughs> and see if there's anything there. And that's been going on since. Now, why was this a good idea? I told you why the hydrogen line was a good idea. But there was something else we were aware of <coughs> which to this day favors radio frequencies for searching. And this is the, um, a graph which I always like to show because I'm sure it's been shown millions of times in the universe. And it looked exactly like this, it's just the lettering was different. And this is a graph which shows the level of natural noise in the cosmos as a function of frequency in gigahertz. So here's a tenth of a gigahertz, that's the frequency of an FM radio. Here's one gigahertz, that's typical of cell phones. Uh, radar systems are in here. Uh, commu communication of uh, television to people's homes is right, right out here. And so that's where we are in the spectrum. Now you look at this and what we know and every civilization will know <coughs> is that there are three sources of noise in the universe that matter. One is radiation from electrons orbiting in the uh, magnetic fields of a galaxy. They all have them. In our galaxy it leads to noise which follows this curve here. It rises, becomes very strong at lower frequencies. Notice this is a logarithmic scale. The second source is so-called quantum noise. The fact that uh, electromagnetic radi radiation comes in photons and as you go to higher frequencies the fo it takes fewer photons for a given po power level and they sort of pitter-patter on like rain on a roof and the pitter-patter gets stronger and stronger as you go to higher frequencies. So this is quantum noise and this has uh, <coughs> been converted into a temperature scale which you can do just by taking H nu over K for the photons. Interestingly, the there is a third source of noise which we didn't know in 1960 but is there which is this which is the so-called three degree black body radiation. The primordial the remnant radiation from the fireball which formed the universe. And it's kind of interesting that that plays a role in selecting what frequency you should search for. Well, you add these all together and there's, you have noise which cannot be eliminated by any technology. And you get the curve you see here and it has a minimum here. And we know this and all civilizations will know it. They all are subject to this. And the laws of thermodynamics say, thermodynamics say there's no technology that can escape this noise. It's there to minimize or limit your sensitivity. And this says then that the ultimate frequencies for communicating in space are here in the microwave region, what we call the microwave region. And that's true for every civilization. And we in fact exploit this. As I pointed out, our radar systems are here. Our direct uh, transmissions to Earth are here. And this is so we can do those things cheaply. We can use 18 inch dishes instead of three meter dishes on our roofs to collect a television direct to home and so forth. Uh, all our communications with spacecraft in NASA are with frequencies right in here. So <coughs> this is where we searched and why people <coughs> have favored this region for all of the last 50 years. Now recently we moved on to looking for some light signals and I'll show you why because there's a special situation there. In any case there have been <coughs> I said over a hundred searches and along the way we also developed this thing which I have Lynn says I must tell you though you already heard about it because it's got to be on the video 
<laughs> and uh, <coughs> this was uh, invented back in 1962, 61, <coughs> in a follow-up meeting to the first search, which was called Project Ozma, in which I was asked by the uh, National <coughs> uh, <coughs> Academy of Sciences to convene a meeting to discuss this whole subject and see just what uh, people thought. And so I convened a meeting of all the people in the world who I knew were thinking about extraterrestrial intelligent life, all 12 of them. <laughs> and they all came. And we all met in Green Bank. And a day or two before the meeting, I, as the convener of this thing, the entire local organizing committee, uh, so we, you know, we need an agenda. We're not just going to get in a room and start talking. We have to have themes. We have to have subjects for the various sessions. And so I thought about what, what is it we need to know about to predict n sub t. That's the total number of detectable civilizations in our galaxy. What do we know? And what we know is, uh, in a way, revealed to us by the history of our own solar system. How the solar system came about, how the planets came about, when they are habitable, what were the chances of life, etc. So it turns out that uh, you need seven factors to describe that whole picture, the whole history of the evolution of the solar system. And they can give you n sub t. Now, how does this work? We're after n sub t, and we start with the rate of star formation. Of course, the more stars you, you uh, <coughs> create, the more planets, <coughs> the more intelligent civilizations will, there will be. And uh, they have to be suitable stars, ones that can give rise to life. And here's <coughs> this is actually a low figure. These are old figures that have been now improved by recent observations. About 10 per year is right for that number. Uh, <coughs> now you want to multiply that by the fraction of stars with planetary systems. That'll give you the rate of production of planetary systems. And uh, this was the guess back at the 1960. Today we know that it's at least 0.5 and probably greater than that. Now, in each system, there will be some number of Earth-like worlds. Now, by that, we mean habitable worlds, where conditions are suitable for life, which we've come to understand today means temperatures on the surface between the freezing and boiling points of water. And you've heard all about that. And <coughs> that is typically one to three. In our own system, that includes Earth. Would have included Mars if it had been just slightly more massive and could have held an atmosphere. Maybe you can include Europa. There's three right there. So it's of the order of one to three. Then you multiply by the fraction of those Earth-like planets where life develops. And <coughs> that is, uh, I've given the really pessimistic number, which nobody believes, that it's much closer to one. And that's based on the fact that our chemists have found a multitude of chemical pathways to the development, the formation of the molecules basic to life, purines, pyrimidines, amino acids, and all that. Uh, <coughs> Now, th this we come to the, well, they have to multiply this next fraction, which is the fraction of these which, on which intelligence develops. That one right now is still problematical. There are arguments in all directions. Uh, there are some people say it's very small, that it was a freakish event that we are here thinking. Other people s look at the fossil record and see that the size of the brain has always increased and, uh, and tells us that eventually you will always, given enough time, develop an intelligent species. So this is slightly vexed, and of course I lean to the, the figure one, and I do reject an argument which is made by some eminent paleontologists, which I think is just really showing a lack of understanding. And the argument they make is, well, look, there have been in the history of the Earth something like 300,000 different species of things, and only one became intelligent. Doesn't that mean the chances are one in 300,000? And this should be one in 300,000. And what that does not take into consideration is that it takes time to produce intelligence. And there will always be one species that becomes intelligent first. And we'll look around and discover, ooh, there's only one of us. Does that mean we're really improbable? No, it just means we're the first. And given enough time, there would be more intelligent creatures. And if we left the Earth for whatever reason, bad reason probably, <coughs> there would be other intelligent creatures. It may take another billion years or so, but they would come. And, uh, People always, at this point, they usually ask me, well, what do they look like? <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, the obvious answer is that they'll be, the, the chimps will become intelligent, or the 
the anobos, I guess they're called, the primates that are closest to us. Uh, actually, living here in California, my prime candidate is raccoons <laughs> <laughs> or squirrels. They both outsmart us. They get into bird feeders. There's no stopping them. Anyway, there are creatures stand. The, the, the squirrels stand up on two feet and can use their hands. You know, they're they're just watching us. They're ready to take <laughs> over. <laughs> just watch. They're they're waiting. They're going to pounce one of these days and take over the earth. Uh, and then <coughs> we have to multiply with a fraction of intelligent beings which develop technology. And again, th this is perhaps problematical. It does depend on your ability to manipulate tools. I don't think you can have technology on a totally water planet because you need metals, I think. You need fire to build things that can release energy in, in amounts which can be detected across interstellar space. Uh, but on Earth, amongst us, technology has been developed independently five times, so that is not a freak event. If you have the, the ability to manufacture tools, it's going to happen. Uh, so this is, could be one. Now multiply all those together, <coughs> and these numbers, and you'll get something like those first six factors all multiply together to be one. That makes it really convenient as a rule of thumb. Uh, <coughs> and the last factor is the lifetime of a civilization with an ability to communicate in a way you can detect. Those words should have been added. Uh, because what you have here is the, the this first, first six give you the rate of production of detectable civilizations. The total number is equal to that times the length of time they exist on average. Just like the student body here on this campus, the number of students here is equal to the number that enter each year times the average time they stay here. So <coughs> then this last factor is the really problem problematical one because the only example we have is ourselves. We have been easily detectable since 1950 through our television broadcasts and our high power radars. We are detectable before that, by the way, by the lights of our cities at, at night to anybody who's got a five kilometer telescope. So, you know, it gets to be a little problematical just how you define what this factor is. It's usually written with a capital L. But the end result is when you multiply all seven together, you get the number of detectable civilizations. And uh, <coughs> We don't really know <coughs> many of those factors accurately. And in, in science, when you don't really know something very well, it makes it more believable to write it in fancy letters. <laughs> so that's, that's why we have it this way. And it's easy to remember. And it's something like one times the longevity of civilizations. And if you happen to see a car going around with this license plate, that's me. <laughs> The only way I could fit the equation out of license plates. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually making a political statement because it's implying that intelligence is common and that L is a long time. Yeah. So <coughs> since those early days, we've gone on to much larger telescopes and other projects. This is the 85-foot uh, telescope at uh, Harvard University, which was used for many, many years to search continuously for signals. One day it had a structural failure and has since not been used. And you can't quite see it. There's a little boy standing here. I don't know where he went. But he's only four years old. He was put there to make it look bigger than it really is. Uh, <coughs> and we've gone down to the giant telescopes. This is the largest in the world, the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico, which has been used in many SETI searches and is used continuously now to collect the data that's used in the SETI at Home program, which I how many of you said do a study at home? My goodness, usually half the audience puts up their hands. Well, you should learn about it. It's, uh, you can, it's on the web, it's free. It's a program you download. It's studyathome.org, I think. And uh, <coughs> once you've loaded the software, the data which is all accumulated at UC Berkeley will be sent out to you in packets, and the program will automatically search through the data, taken at air will for signs of an intelligent signal. And in the many years now, it's 10 years at least, that this program has been running, they've seen about 200 candidate signals. And what is then done is to go back to the telescope, look at the same place in the sky on the same frequency to see if the signal's still there. Never has been yet. We don't know what that means. We originally thought that just meant it was all the stuff they detected was just 
uh, statistical uh, accidents or radio interference. Now, as you'll hear from me later, uh, we're beginning to think that maybe the signals are there, but they're usually transient. They're not there all the time. So they'll be there one day, and you can maybe have to wait a year before the signal comes back. So we may have, in fact, have detected an ETI and did not recognize it. Well, this telescope has a reflector 1,000 feet across, 300 meters, by far the largest on Earth. It focuses the radiation on the suspended platform, which is about uh, 450 feet in the air, suspended upon the three plat towers, each of which is 10 feet taller than the Washington Monument. The central structure that you see there is the size of the next largest telescope. Here it is. And uh, <coughs> you can get some feel for the size of it by this railing that's here. It's actually 100 meters long, the size of the next largest telescope. And <coughs> in, in this particular ray dome is, is actually two reflectors, one of which is a 60-footer, which is used to take the radiation, the captured radiation from the big dish, which is spherical in shape, therefore does not focus radiation to a sharp focus and corrects the radiation for the spherical aberration so that it does come to a, a perfect focus. And there, there's a combination of present time seven energy collectors in there which collect the radiation, allows you to do a radio image of the sky, but primarily <coughs> gives you the enormous sensitivity to detect signals. Now, also in here, there is a radar transmitter which transmits a peak power of one million watts. Keep that in mind, we're gonna see some more of those transmitter powers in a while. Uh, one million watts. Now that one million watts when focused into a narrow beam, and the beam is about two minutes of arc, a little almost the same as the acuity of the human eye. When focused in a, uh, into a beam of two minutes of arc is so bright that <coughs> it outshines our sun in the direction of the beam, and by a factor of about a million in the radio frequency which is in the microwave window at about two gigahertz. That signal is easily detectable by a similar instrument from anywhere in the Milky Way galaxy, anywhere. And that shows us that, that we can detect other civilizations. They can be, if they only have to be like us, and we can detect them. Now they have to have the thing aimed at us for that to work, which of course greatly decreases the chances of success, but that's another reason why the signals may be transient. The signal may be aimed at you only occasionally. So <coughs> this is our signature to space at the present time uh, and tells you that, in fact, a search is plausible. It's plausible that you could detect something with these searches. This is just a picture of the reflector. It's got seven acres of <coughs> surface panels, each actually curved to the curvature of a sphere, which is 870 feet in diameter, and, <coughs> and accurate in the placing of the surface to what, one millimeter. That's what it takes to get this full possible gain of this instrument. What is the surface made of? The surface is aluminum mesh, and the, the focus isn't good enough to see this, but it's perforated aluminum sheets, and they are sitting on aluminum beams that are bent to the spherical shape underneath. And there are 38,778 of them. Thank you for asking. Still much better. <laughs> 30 38,778 surface panels uh, in the Arecibo reflector. Yeah, yeah. I was why it was chosen to put in Puerto Rico. Uh, good question. By the way, interrupt me and ask questions. I said this is a stream of consciousness thing. And, uh, why is it in Puerto Rico? Uh, <coughs> it, was originally it was originally built uh, following the launch of Sputnik. Uh, the launch of Sputnik scared the world, and particularly the U.S., because they, there were paranoid visions of the Soviet Union putting nuclear bombs in orbiting spacecraft like Sputnik, and uh, in a nuclear war, just deorbiting them so they would fall on Earth, you know, in the U.S. So they wanted a way to f detect the presence of what are called black satellites to this day, because what the idea was that these orbiting bombs would be painted black on the outside so they wouldn't reflect any light, so you couldn't see them. And they would have radar absorbing substance on them so you couldn't detect them with radar, so they'd be invisible. And this was really scary, and it was a good reason to be scary. That would be a dreadful weapon to have up there. Right? Um, and they wanted some way to detect these. So, 
there was a report, <coughs> which ultimately turned to be wrong, turned out to be wrong, that behind Sputnik they could see a trail of ionization. Sputnik was going high speed through the thin atmosphere and was allegedly ionizing things and creating a, a, a trail of ionization behind it. And ionization does reflect radar. And so they, what was <coughs> wanted was to check this out and to build a radar so powerful that it could detect these, detect these ion trails and in this way provide a means to detect any black satellites. Uh, the th theory was done as to what it would take to detect those ionization trails and it turned out to do it you needed a thousand foot telescope as the transmitter and receiver and count it using a one megawatt transmitter. And that was the bit why it, <coughs> the, uh, the instrument was started. But of course, why is it in Puerto Rico? That's for another reason. Uh, this was all done by uh, Cornell University, at electrical engineering department. The Department of Defense was eager to pour all the money is required into this. But along the way, the Arecibo Astronomy Department sort of put up there and said, hey, you know, we could use this to do radio astronomy. You know, this would be pretty neat, a thousand foot radio telescope. And <coughs> the original inventors didn't like this idea much because they knew it was going to get in and sort of slow things down while this was thought through. But eventually it was decided, yeah, we'll make this thing so you can look in different parts of the sky. Well, it was also to realize, hey, you could use this thing. It's going to be a radar to make radar studies of the planets. So we need to put it somewhere where we can direct the beam of the telescope at planets. Well, it, the dish is spherical. and. Um, <coughs> And it looks in different parts of the sky by moving these things on this beam. And it can o as a result, it can only look within 20 degrees of straight up. So if you were going to look at the planets a lot, you had to put it where it would be able to see the planets as much as possible. And the planets all hover around the ecliptic. And the ecliptic goes from about plus 20 to minus 20 declination, which means over minus 20 to 20 latitude. So ideally, the telescope needed to be on the equator. But then, the, since this had sort of a military uh, aspect to it, they decided it had to be in U.S. controlled territory. So we looked for, I didn't do it, people looked for a place that was U.S. controlled and was as close to the, con the equator as possible. And the candidates were Hawaii, plus 20 latitude, Puerto Rico, also plus 20 latitude, uh, American Samoa, and Cuba. This, <laughs> you know, oh, what? <laughs> this was 1959, year after Sputnik. In those days, Cuba was our friend. And it was almost put in Cuba. And what was done was to get an expert, which Cornell happened to have, on <coughs> identifying landforms from aircraft photographs. And they looked for a place in any of those places I just mentioned which had a bowl, the right shape, just to minimize the cost of creating the big reflector. And um, it turned out that this bowl here, if you saw the original aerial photograph of it, almost looked man-made. It's almost a perfect spherical shape. There was almost no carving needed to make it so it would hold this big spherical bowl. And this bowl, by the way, is 200 feet from top to bottom. It had to be a pretty deep bowl to do this. So <coughs> it was chosen, uh, selected to be in Puerto Rico for the reason I just gave you. And that's why it's there to this day. Very hard to move. I don't think it's <laughs> going to go anywhere. <laughs> <coughs> and there's interesting things along the way people realized, such as what would the Earth look like to extraterrestrials. And the main sign of our existence were, were our television broadcasts, still are. And uh, actually the television transmitters in those days and today beam the radiation out towards the horizon, because that's where the receiving antennas are, which means that most of it goes off tangentially to the surface of the Earth where the ra uh, radar transmitter is. And that means that uh, when the east coast of the U.S. is rising for a, a location, it will see the transmitters. They will be right at the edge of the Earth, beamed at them as they uh, uh, <coughs> the, the people in outer space will see the transmitters right at the edge of the Earth because they're beamed at them. And then later when the East Coast sets, 
And you see it when it's the other way around. So there's this sort of pancake beam rotating with the Earth, and twice a day it crosses everything in the universe and makes these spikes. And there's a similar pe peaks for Western Europe uh, <coughs> and um, for the East Coast and the West Coast of the U.S. And then there's a subsidiary peaks for the other minor places like Europe. You know, it's <laughs> of course, that's all changed. This is an old diagram. It's never, never been uh, really brought up to date. But it meant the Earth would have looked like a sort of flashing light in the sky. Spir slowly flashing, but pretty good evidence that there was an intelligent civilization there. And also people point out you could actually find out interesting things like uh, that there are different uh, p uh, political regions because the frequencies used would be different from one area to another. The form of the uh, television broadcast would change from place to place. And you could even tell when there are storms, believe it or not, because the storms shake the TV antennas and introduce a Doppler effect into the transmitted signal. So you could learn, uh, and also of course, when the signals appear and disappear uh, locates their position on the planet. So you can actually map the planet, the cities of the planet, or the transmitter locations of a planet, and the weather and all of that from this. So this is all very interesting. It's still a possibility. You know, once we get uh, the ability to see television stations. Now, <coughs> along the way, as all of this was going on, a hundred searches, um, uh, some people <coughs> started thinking about what might the signal be look, might li look like. And a way of determining that is to try to design your own signal. It makes you think about what is a good signal to send. If you're an ET civilization, <coughs> you want to send something interesting and, and conspicuous to another world. And the uh, first thing that was sent was a plaque, which is on the Pioneer 10 and 11 spacecraft. It's about the size of a license plate, actually. And it's in the form you see here. Uh, as I say, it's, it's about so big. It was actually made in San Carlos, uh, down the coast from here. There's a little shop there. You can go um, and you can buy repl replicas of this, duplicates. If they have the die. And it's very nice. They have them mounted on nice hardwood boards. Uh, and when you, you go in the place, it mu what it makes mostly is golf trophies. But along the way, they made these, which are the signs of our existence in outer space at this time. And <coughs> this was designed by Carl Sagan, his wife, and me. And it has on it several things. The weirdest thing is this, which looks like a 14-legged spider. And this is actually a map showing the location of the Earth with respect to 14 pulsars, pulsating radio sources. And it's, you can't see it, I'm afraid, in this. But they, these are binary representations of the pulsing periods of those pulsars to identify them, because each pulsar has a unique period. And up there is the hydrogen atom in its two lowest states to indicate that that gives you a scale of length. It's the wavelength of the hydrogen frequency. And it gives you a time scale, the time scale, one period of, a, a <coughs> of the 1420 megahertz uh, radiation. Now here's a sketch of the solar system, size of the planets given in terms of the wavelength of, which is eight inches, of the hydrogen radiation. Little sketch here showing the spacecraft left planet three and was accelerated by passing by planet f uh, five, Jupiter. And here's what we always think are the most interesting things, which are us, the extraterrestrials want to know what we look like. And so here we are with a spacecraft behind to give scale, but the size is also given here in terms of the wavelength. And a typical man and woman, which <coughs> provoked a lot of interesting reactions, uh, perceptions of this, which depend very much on the perceiver. It's a very interesting psychological test. Uh, the artist, wh who was, which was Linda Sagan, a woman, tried to incorporate uh, all the <coughs> basic characteristics of different ethnic groups on Earth. I don't know, maybe we can see it better here. Yeah. So <coughs> that the, this, the woman has Asian features, uh, the male has Caucasian features, but uh, supposedly uh, black hair, although it doesn't look very black to me. Uh, the man is taller, and these people are the average height of humans on Earth at that time. Uh, the man has his hand up. Now that's supposed to be a greeting, but is it? 
does it look like an aggressive gesture? He's ready to hit, hit somebody. Or something. <laughs> uh, and the fact that the woman is slightly smaller than the man was taken by f some feminists to suggest that the, man, the woman was standing behind the man in an inferior position. But if you look at her feet, she's not. <laughs> she's right alongside. <laughs> but it was interesting that people saw this with regard, usually interpreted with interpretations which were things that they were repelled by. They weren't excited. They didn't say, hey, it looks just like me. And said, they said, it doesn't look like me. Uh, I showed this on Canadian television once, on the equivalent of the Today Show, on Canadian television. And when it was over, the entire organization was in a frenzy. Because it turned out this was the first time naked humans had ever been shown on Canadian television. <laughs> and they thought there was going to be a furor, they were all going to lose their jobs. Uh, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Uh, <coughs> later, we actually sent a radio message to space. This is the so-called air message in 1974, sent on ap April 16th, 1974. It's 36 light years from Earth now. So you know, a lot farther than our spacecraft. It, it, that plaque I just showed you is just out beyond the orbit of Pluto right now. It's at 100 astronomical units from the Earth. That's actually twice the distance to Pluto. But this is 36 light years out. And it consisted of a series of, shown here, zeros and ones. It was two tones separated by 75 hertz uh, sent in the microwave band. Well, you look at this now, whoa, what do we make of that? That's incredible because it looks just like the essay questions for the final. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can give you one of these for the final. Yeah, please. When I used to teach this same course, I always put one of these on the final. But once I tell you how to <laughs> decipher it, it's not hard. <laughs> and the f your first glance when you look at it, oh my God, what are we going to do with this? You know, what is it? Is it a picture? Is it a, is it a message? Is it Morse code? Is it some coding of some language that we don't know? Uh, well, it may be, but there is a way to do this which makes them decipherable and understandable. And the that, that way to do that is to count all these characters. I hope some of you have done that by now. Uh, well, I'll help you. So some of you probably are only halfway through counting. There's 1,679. Well, that's interesting. That's a weird number. <coughs> well, the hint here is that this is how the extraterrestrials are telling you what this is. You find out that a little bit of math that 1679 is the product of 73 and 23. Two prime numbers. Oh boy. And uh, which means you can break this thing up into 73 groups of 23 characters or 23 groups of 73 characters, but no other way. The implication is that this is actually a two dimensional message. And you should break it up in the way I just showed you. There are two options. And if you break it up into 23 groups of 73 and just write them one under the other in a raster, you get something that looks like a really bad crossword puzzle. But if you put 73 groups of 23, you get this. <laughs> and these are each, each line is 23 characters across. And by the way, of course, they weren't in color. I've j the colors are here just to make it easy to explain. But it would have been in black and white. And when you see this, obviously this didn't happen by chance. You've done the right decryption. You've got the coding system. That's step one. That's the easy part. Step two is what does it all mean? And, and because the information content is so small, <coughs> you have to get some real experts. And if you do, it, it can all be interpreted. It can be all be brought to light. And uh, when, when this was first put together, it was test marketed on a whole bunch of professors. None of them got it all. <laughs> But the ones with the right specialties did. Uh, the top row of characters in white are the binary numbers 1 through 10 with a parity bit added. It's a thing that's done in computers. In this case, they're put there to give you, tell you where the start of the number is. It allows you to under interpret the red group, which is, is, turns out to be the numbers 1, 6, 7, 8, and 15. That's the big mystery. 1, 6, 7, 8, and 15. Anybody know what that is? Does that ring a bell? Yeah. yeah. What are they? One, six, seven. 
Yeah, carbon. What are the others? There's three. One, six, seven, eight, and fifteen. Atom atomic numbers, not atomic weights. It's atomic numbers. One, six, seven, eight, and fifteen. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus. The stuff. Yeah, hey, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> it's what makes up DNA. And uh, <coughs> these green things are, in fact, the chemical formulae for molecules. And uh, you have to sort of really think about that. But it turns out that these here are the formula for phosphate. This is the formula for deoxyribose. So you've got a chain here of phosphate, deoxyribose, phosphate, deoxyribose, which is the latter of the DNA molecule. And these turn out to be the <coughs> formula for adenine, guanine cytosine and uh, thymine, the turns and pyrimidines <coughs> of, of DNA. And this shows the whole thing is wound into a double helix. So it's describing crudely DNA and should be recognized by that, you know, not in two minutes, that's all I gave you here, but if you gave all the biochemists in the world this thing and told them you got a month to solve it, certainly they would. This is a big number, it's four billion, which is the number of codons in the human DNA. So it's telling us, in a way, giving a measure of our evolution, the complexity of our genome, and it winds into a sketch of a human being, as best you could do here. And the human being's size is given here, again, in the wavelength of the message. Uh, <coughs> this is our population at that time, about three billion. Down here is a sketch of something, which astronomers all spot pretty fast. It's a solar system. The planet three displaced towards the human to show that that's where we live. And down here is something that's usually hard because it's upside down. It's a telescope focusing rays to a point, to a focus. And its size is given here, 300 meters, which is the Arecibo telescope. The size of the largest telescope on Earth giving a measure of the size, the quality of our technology and also the size of the telescope that sent the message. So that's the Arecibo message. It took three minutes to send. And by the time the last characters were being sent, the first characters were passing the orbit of Mars. It just shows you how much better this means of communication is than spacecraft. Three minutes to go to Mars. It takes three months at least with the speediest space spacecraft we have to do that. This was followed by <coughs> a much more complicated message, which is a phonograph record, which is on the uh, <coughs> Pioneer 10 and 11, or not, no, the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 spacecraft. And this is the spacecraft, and right here you see a gold box, gold-plated box, which has in it, this is the box up close, it has strange hieroglyphics on the cover, and the strange hieroglyphics are there to tell you what to do with what's in the box. And what's in the box is this, which is a long playing phonograph record. Now that's, of course. Has anyone ever seen one of <laughs> <laughs> few, few of you have seen those, yeah. They still, you still can, still can find them in your parents' attic and <laughs> places like that. Uh, this one is metal, gold plated, and two sided. And, uh, and most of it is music, Earth's music, picked out by a committee of eminent musicologists. Includes everything from Brahms and Beethoven to Blind Willie Nelson and uh, folks of that era. This was 1977. Interestingly, the Beatles are not on here. The Beatles were at their peak about then. And they're not on here for an interesting reason. The musicologists desperately wanted to put a Beatles piece on here. And uh, they went to the Beatles and said, please, we want to immortalize you. You will, you will live in for eternity, and there will be a rec record of you for eternity in outer space. He said, no. Nope. It's copyrighted, and we don't release our copyright to anyone. <laughs> and in fact, they stuck by that. And so the Beatles aren't on here, which is their, their loss. <laughs> and uh, anyway, this is launched. It's on the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, which are the, actually the most <coughs> distant spacecraft from Earth right now. Now, the technology had moved on in the radio. We would gotten to our own computer chips. This shows you one of the computer boards. Now, this is from the era of about 1990. <coughs> and it has um, a, a, <coughs> a 
specific, uh, specific specifically designed computer chips to allow us to construct a multi-channel receiver at low cost, and this was built for uh, Project Phoenix, was a, which was a joint NASA SETI Institute project, which started in the year 1992 on the 500th anniversary of Columbus's, well, Columbus's discovery of San Salvador Island, which you have to be careful to be politically <laughs> correct. It was the discovery of America by people from Southern Europe. That was what that was. And this is what the equipment, still four racks of equipment, but then <coughs> now this one could do about uh, 10 million channels. And it had, did have the computer hardware and software to search for the signals which we expected to come from the extraterrestrials. Now is this still at Arecibo or is this at it's, it's all been cannibalized. It doesn't exist anymore. It's been replaced. <laughs> this is a typical screen from a monitor screen when you're observing to make sure everything's going right. What you have across here is typically 600 different frequency channels, so only a small fraction of all of them. And each horizontal line is one second's worth of data. And where you see a <coughs> bright spot, it means that during that second in that channel, there was more than the average radio power. And most of it is noise, of course. This slanty line you see here is the signal from a Pioneer 10 spacecraft, which at that time was out about the orbit of Pluto and radiating one watt. So easily detected. It just shows the sensitivity of our equipment. And <coughs> the slanty line is very important, as it turns out, because what makes it? Does anybody have a theory? Anybody explain why that line is such that the radio frequency is, in fact, uh, well, this is the newest data. That's the oldest data. So the newest data is, oh, I'm sorry, the newest data is at the top. The, the oldest data is down here. Mm -hmm. This is called a waterfall plot because it moves down all the time. So the newest data is at a lower frequency than the oldest data. Okay, make a guess. Is it the Doppler effect? Well, that's one guess. What do you think? Yeah, Doppler effect. Yeah, it's the Doppler effect. Good. <laughs> I should point out that Dr. Drake was dean at uh, Santa Cruz. So this is your chance to show him what Stanford students are like. <laughs> well, they just did. <laughs> Two of them at once. Yeah, and I think some good. of the others had gotten it too. And, <laughs> and it, if you think about it, well, this is, it uh, it's not totally obvious until you think about it a little. The, the frequency will always go down with time because of the, of the changing Doppler effect. And that's because the, Earth, the, the actual source of the changing velocity is not the spacecraft being accelerated. It's going along at a very s steady rate. It's that the Earth is rotating and the telescope is moving with the Earth. And if you just sit down for a minute, you'll see when the Earth rotates, it always has the effect that the velocity vector component towards the spacecraft is always re becoming less. And so you, you always get a growing redshift to a lower frequency. Now that turns out to be very valuable because it's a, we use this in all of our searches nowadays to identify true extraterrestrial signals. Any signal from Earth will not drift in frequency. If it's in space, it's in a spacecraft or something, it will have some weird drift. But you can predict exactly what the drift should be due to the Doppler effect of the rotation of the Earth. And if that's the drift you see, it means this, the source of the radiation is fixed with respect to the stars. It's a good candidate for an extraterrestrial signal. And that's our main diagnostic. And we need that because whenever we observe any, in any given record, you know, with all the channels, you typically just take at least 100 signals. And, uh, mo and they're mostly from Earth, of course, but you need a way to find that out quickly, and the Doppler effect is a way that that's done. Now, <coughs> in the late 1990s, it was decided that we needed more observing time. SETI was being conducted at Arecibo, other places, but in almost in all places as guest observers on somebody else's telescope. And for instance, at Arecibo, the SETI project had 20 days a year. So very slow going and very inefficient because you'd set the equipment up, get it all running, you'd observe for 20 days, you'd go away, come back a year later and everything was not working anymore. You had to spend a week getting it all operating again. And so a decision was made 
to, if we could, find the money to build a dedicated radio telescope for SETI. And it needed to be big, maybe not as big as Arecibo, but sort of in that class. And how do you do that? Well, Arecibo, to duplicate Arecibo would take more than $100 million, and we didn't have, nobody was going to produce that kind of money. And the idea was developed to make a big telescope by taking many small telescopes and connecting them together so that the radio waves captured by all of them are eventually brought together in phase, as we say, in synchronism, so that it c created the same effect as the focusing capability <coughs> of a telescope. It, a foc a telescope, when you really think about it, what it does is take all the captured radiation and bring it together at one point in synchronous. <coughs> Now this was going to do it not with light being focused by a reflector, but by correcting the path lengths of the signals in some way in a computer. Uh, <coughs> in older times it was done by using different l lengths of transmission lines. So what you see here is the first effort at this. And <coughs> this was a prototype array to demonstrate this could be done. It was built not far from here in Brioni's Park. If any of you live in Orinda or Lafayette or Walnut Creek, <laughs> it's between, it's, it's a, a, for a, a, a nature preserve that's just back of Berkeley in the hills there. And, <clears throat> and this was a case of using small dishes. In this case, the idea was to exploit the fact that at that time, this was about 19, late 1990s, uh, there was a huge industry building small dishes for p people to use to collect television from satellites. And the typical size was 10 feet. This was the largest size you could get 12 feet. And these cost $1,000. Now these had been uh, uh, altered so as to allow you to steer them anywhere in the sky. And notice there are no gears. These are extremely inexpensive. $1,000, you had a fully steerable antenna uh, <coughs> 12 feet in diameter. It worked up to frequencies of 15 gigahertz. And uh, it was really, these are really marvelous things. And they cost $1,000. To, and a goal was established to create an antenna which was one hectare in uh <coughs> collecting area, which is 10,000 square meters. And that would have taken about 1,000 of these. Now that's a big number, but not ridiculous. Uh, in fact, the manufacturers of these were quite prepared to build all thousand of them in a month and we were able to fit them into three big semi-trailers. And we were almost ready to do that. But first, <coughs> we did do uh, this, this set to, to show that it can be done and that they can be connected together. Now those two people standing there, one is uh, Leo Blitz, who was the director of the Berkeley Radio Astronomy Laboratory at the time. This person, some of you may know something of that's Lynette Cook, famous space artist, who was uh, doing the artwork for this thing. This is what it looked like. Seven dishes was the prototype array. This is what it looked like, and it worked just fine. And as a result of this, uh, a proposal was made to Paul Allen, co-founder of Microsoft. There's a building named after him here, uh, <coughs> to fund the, the construction of the 10,000 square meter system. And he in fact produced the money to develop the uh, whole design and technology and promised $13 million to construct because that was the estimate based on these as to what it would take. And so the Allen Telescope Array was, and this is another picture of it. So the Allen Telescope Array was started back in around the year 2000. And it was to be a new generation of radio telescope. And in fact, it is an extremely good way, not only to get large collecting area, but the ability to make very sharp radio images of the sky. It can kill two birds with one sta stone. And this uh, <coughs> pr project in process, in progress, a project in progress between the SETI Institute and UC Berkeley. It uses these somewhat odd telescopes for a reason. And that was, in, in his looking back from hindsight, this may not have been a smart thing. Um, it was 
decided that we wanted to be able to observe any frequency in the microwave window at any time, because who knew where the SETI, the SETI signals would be? And so we wanted a telescope that would, could do that. And to do that, you have to use a special kind of feed and, and collector antenna called a log periodic feed. How many of you have ever heard that, a oh, log periodic feed? Ooh, I should have put in a slide which shows you one. They're very odd looking things. They look like something very dangerous. Uh, <clears throat> but they can collect uh, our good antennas from all the way from less than one gigahertz up to 15 gigahertz. But uh, they have a very long focal length and as a result you have to use two reflectors to make it all work right. So this is why they look the way they do. Um, and this shows you the ray paths. Uh, and I'll go back and do that again. The ray comes in, it's reflected off the main reflector, then to the secondary reflector, and finally focused on the log periodic feed. And this may look to you as though it's looking at the ground, but it's not. The, uh, as you can see, this is when it's looking horizontally, because the incoming rays are horizontal. So it's looking at the horizon, but it looks as though it's looking at the ground. And <coughs> this was adopted as the basic design for the Gallon Telescope Array. The reflectors are, are six meters in diameter, 20 feet in diameter. And, here, and they're made by taking big sheets of aluminum and pressing them against a mold with huge bladders full of water, just forcing them by the weight of the water to conform to the mold. And this way you make a very precise dish very easily. And there are actually eight of them here, eight of the dishes stacked and on a special carrier that was made to carry them from the manufacturer, which is in Idaho Falls, Idaho, to the site, which is at Hat Creek, which is 20 miles north of Mount Lassen in Northern California. And there they have been constructed, still being constructed, in a tent. And this shows one of the reflectors with the backup structure being attached. You can see on the left side a pedestal, which, is, which will hold up the whole thing when it's assembled. And uh, here's one that's ready to be moved out and put on a pedestal. And there's a special machine that comes and picks it up, and takes it out of the tent. And here are two finished dishes with some very happy people. Uh, giving you a sense of the size of these things. The <coughs> log periodic feed is not in place yet, so you don't see that here. And uh, <coughs> this is a more recent picture. Notice there are now shrouds. And this is to keep snow and water uh, off from the focusing device and the, and the electronics, which are at the, <coughs> the feed system, the log periodic feed. And this is a current picture showing you that uh, this is the total array as it exists, 42 antennas. That's as much as could be afforded because of what turned out here. And that's why I mentioned that going for all frequencies at all time may have been a mistake, is that these dishes are much more expensive than $1,000. And the result was that the amount of money provided by Paul Allen and some other gifts that have been received has only been sufficient to build 42 of them. And what's needed to make 10,000 square meters is 350. So 42 to down and 308 to go. Mm -hmm. And right now, none are under construction because the, unfortunately, the re recession has caused people to stop making gifts to things like this. And so we're stuck with 42. They are operating and they do just fine. They work very well, just as they are supposed to. Now, that's the present status of radio SETI, except for one thing I'll get back to in a minute. But along the way, a few years ago, it was recognized that maybe we should be looking for optical signals also. And what's the history there? The history is 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, the most powerful lasers we had on Earth were just things that made a few watts, couldn't possibly be focused into a bright beam that could be seen across many light years. And so it made no sense to search for optical setting. Besides the noise level, as I showed you, was larger at those wavelengths. But not for SETI, 
not for us folks, we folks, us folks. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> there's some other technology under development, which is devices to create en clean energy through nuclear fusion. And one of the prime approaches is being pursued at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, not far from here. And there they're trying to achieve nuclear fusion by heating a little capsule full of hydrogen to a temperature of about 10 million degrees, at which, at which point it will fuse and you'll get out all the energy that you could get from a hydrogen bomb from that much stuff, and that's a lot. Now, <coughs> this is a, in principle a very good system, but it's a challenge. You've got a, a, a little glass bead about the size of a BB, it's hollow, inside of it there's hydrogen gas, and you've got to heat that gas to 10 million degrees. As you do so, the, temp the pressure goes way up, and this thing's going to explode, obviously. So you've got to heat it up so fast that when the, before the explosion can happen, it's already reached the temperature where it fuses. Well, how do you do that? You zap it with a laser beam, and it has to be really bright. And as it turns out, with even the best lasers they produce, it takes about 170 lasers all at once to zap the bead. Now, they've developed a laser called Helios, which <coughs> creates a pulse of light whose power is an incredible amount. It's 10 to the 15th power watts, a petawatt. There's a new word for you today, a petawatt. 10 to the 15th watts, which is a thousand times the total power production of all the electrical plants on Earth. So I guess you can't do this very long. <laughs> you have to turn off the Earth. And so the pulse lasts a billionth of a second, a nanosecond. But that's enough. In fact, you have to do it in a nanosecond because after a nanosecond, the whole thing's exploded and it's not going to work. And it takes 170 of these. And so at Lawrence Livermore, there's a huge building the size of a football field with 170 of these lasers. And they're all carefully aligned, and they're going to zap this poor little bead any day now. They're ready to do it and, uh, <clears throat> and hope to achieve ignition, as it's called. Well, that's all good. But to us, what's interesting is this laser <laughs> with its petawatt of power. And you say, whoa, wow, that's a lot. What happens if I take that petawatt of power and focus it into an arrow beam with a 10-meter reflector, as I have on Mauna Kea? Well, it turns out if you work out, the, do the math, it's very simple. You create a flash of light which is brighter than a star for a billionth of a second. And not by a little bit, by about a thousand times. Now, this is in the direction the beam goes. And so maybe the extraterrestrials are signaling us with these things because so easy to detect. You don't need good signal noise ratio. You don't even need big telescopes. And you can tr transmit signals hundreds, thousands of light years in pulses. Now, uh, <coughs> there are presently three projects going in the world. One of them is ours, another is at UC Berkeley, and the other is at Harvard. Uh, this is the start of our project. I just wanted to show you. You, you don't really need <laughs> big modern things to do this. Uh, this is the first uh, telescope at the Lick Observatory, not far from here, being constructed in the year 1888. This is the first building. Notice the lady here in her long dress. Here's another one with a parasol. That's what she's got. They've come to watch the goings on at this operation. You notice the very proud guys standing bravely on top of the dome. And all of this is still there, by the way. If you visit Lick, you'll see exactly the same building, just the way you see it here. And when it was built, it had a 12-inch telescope in it. And it's still there. And this is the one we use for our optical SETI project. It now has in it <coughs> Notice the dome is all wood. Uh, a 40-inch telescope, a one-meter telescope, which you see here. And this was all made with, built by Lick Observatory using cast-off scrap metal and things like that. In fact, a cast-off mirror, which was the center of the big mirror at Lick, where they had to cut a hole in the center so that the light could come out. And they cut out a circle, 40 inches in diameter, and that's become the mirror in this telescope. And it is used <coughs> in optical SETI. And optical SETI is very simple. A whole optical SETI detector can be built for about $2,000 because the stuff you need has been developed for nuclear f physics experiments and it's very cheap. 
the person you see here was an undergraduate student at UC Santa Cruz who built this as a senior project. Uh, she's now a PhD and a uh, Hubble Fellow at UC Berkeley. Uh, <coughs> and the way this works is you get photomultiplier tubes, which with one nanosecond time resolution and time response, and those are available. It's out of catalogs. And we don't use one, we use three. We take the light and we divide it into three paths for a special reason, which was quickly learned to be necessary. The first one of these was built at UC Berkeley with one phototube and it was a nightmare. And the nightmare comes about because you get false positives. What we're looking for is a burst of photons coming in. You'll be looking at a star, you'll be getting starlight, and then what we're looking for is a sudden added flash of light that lasts a nanosecond. And those happen due to cosmic rays hitting detectors, cosmic air showers in the atmosphere, uh, electrical discharges, corona discharge. And <coughs> the first, these were built both at Berkeley and Harvard. They had one detector, and they were getting positives every few minutes, and it would drive them crazy. They were detecting signals every, all over the place. So what you do here is divide the <coughs> light into three beams and send it to three photomultiplier tubes. And in a case like that, you, you get a false positive in only one tube at a time. And so what is done is with a, the, the stream of pulses that come out of the photomultipliers are compared with each other in a coincidence detectors, which are available very cheaply from nuclear physics. And these search for simultaneous arrival of photons at two different detectors, and in this case, three. And <coughs> in this way, false positives are eliminated because they don't arrive at all three detectors at once. But the thing we're looking for will arrive at all three detectors at once. And that's why the three detectors. And this works like a charm and is adopted at all the observatories doing this now. This has been used to search 6,000 stars for flashes of light, in each case only for 10 minutes each. Nothing's been seen yet. And uh, <coughs> it's slow going. And this one does have the downside that they have to be transmitting your direction or it isn't going to work. This shows the, our crew that works at the uh, Lick Observatory. We're about to start a new project uh, which will use seven detectors for reasons that improve the statistics and so forth. And uh, this is a team which involves the director of the Lick, uh, director of operations of the Lick Observatory, this fellow. This is Dan Wertheimer, genius at Berkeley, who designs all the detector stuff. This is the student Shelley White, right? This is me, if you didn't guess. And <coughs> the biggest project of this kind right now is at Harvard. They have a 1.8 meter dish. It's a transit telescope. It has a 64 detector modules. And uh, it uh, does not track, it just sits and the sky rotates through it. In this way, they search a huge swath of the sky for flashes every night. They're very proud of this 1.8 meter mirror because it's the largest telescope east of the Red River. Okay. Now, <coughs> everything I've told you is optimistic. We're doing better and better. But, we're learning that uh, our paradigms change with time and faster than you'd think in one human lifetime. In 50 years, things have changed. We've all these years been looking for those narrow band signals like the one I showed you in that waterfall plot. And now signals are changing so that they're not like that. And our detector, our detection algorithms and our computers are all looking for narrow band signals. And now we here on Earth are going away from narrowband signals. We send almost none now. And here's one that is an example. Uh, <coughs> this is a picture I took a little over a year. It has to be over a year ago because I showed this last year. <laughs> uh, at Barrow, Alaska. This is United States Air Force Point Barrow long range radar site. What this is is a distant early warning radar a bemused radar which is used to, uh, to guard against missiles coming from Asia towards the United States. And there's a super powerful radar in here, and this is one of a chain of these that exists. These are communication antennas which send whatever they see back to like Colorado Springs or something. And it's very interesting. I 
was up there looking for a really quiet site to do SETI. And I found one. I've, there's a place not far from here, not here, because this thing is not quiet. Uh, <coughs> there's a place not far from here where there are no signals at all. It's like the far side of the moon. Perfect, beautiful place to build a radio telescope. We're talking about it. Uh, it's, not in as in as it's not inhospitable as you might think. Uh, the total temperature, the, this, this was in April, uh, the temperature never got above 50 below zero, but you're dressed for it. It's, it's not bad. You get used to it. <laughs> and on this day, I drove up to this thing. Right behind me was my car. In my car, I had a big spectrum analyzer. And I pulled this spectrum analyzer out of my car, and it was battery operated. I set it up and started measuring the spectrum of this radar, wondering when are the security people going to show up. <laughs> they never showed up. <laughs> There are no fences or guards or gates or anything. Where is the TSA when we really need them? <laughs> it's, it's so weird. I went there, I spent half an hour measuring the spectrum of this radar. And nobody came and said, what are you doing there? <laughs> it's amazing. Whoops. This is the spectrum <coughs> as observed there. This is from 800 megahertz, so 8 tenths gigahertz up to 2 gigahertz. The hydrogen line is right in here. And this little bit you see here is, in fact, cell phones uh, from Barrow, Alaska, which is right adjacent to this radar. This is the spectrum of that radar. Notice, not narrow band. And in fact, if you looked at it as time went on, you'd see the spectrum was jumping all over the place. It was narrow band at any given instant, but it was moving around over 100 megahertz. This is called sped, spread spectrum. It's very common these days. Uh, used in almost everything. It's a way, in this case, it's used for military reasons it's to prevent this radar from being jammed. But the same thing is used in cell phones, too, to allow people to share channels. Because when you're talking on a cell phone, there may be a hundred other people all using the same frequency. But if you're using a different spread spectrum, the, the, <coughs> the cell phone has the capability, which is very clever, of disentangling those signals and giving you only the one that's intended for you. So spread spectrum. Our algorithms are not, our present algorithms in our search system will not detect this. And that's a worry. We need to get our software people, and I know there are a lot of those around Stanford, <coughs> to develop algorithms that are affordable and fast, uh, which can s detect things like this in the data. So that's one worry now. In 50 years, we've gone from one form of signal to almost entirely a form of signal we're not, we're not set up to detect. We've got to do something about that. Another thing which is happening, which is even more scary to SETI people, is that the Earth is slowly disappearing from the radio universe. This is the uh, Empire State Building. It's got a big antenna on it that has about 20 TV antennas on it. An even bigger one is <coughs> the Sutro Tower in San Francisco. If you've gone to San Francisco, you've seen this up on a hill. This thing is taller than the Washington Monument. Uh, you can see the scale of the houses here. It's about 100 feet taller than the Washington Monument. It's got more than 30 transmitters on it. And many, and included in there is something like 15 television transmitters. And this shows you what's happened there. This is television stations, and just look at these US UFH TV stations. Uh, <coughs> before we went to digital, a few months ago, notice some of them has had powers as much as 5,000 kilowatts, five megawatts of power. That's five times the power level of the Arecibo transmitter, except it's spread out, fanned out to the side. There's another five megawatt transmitter, three megawatts. This is what it took just to transmit television to rooftop antennas in the Bay Area, which is what this is for. Total power was 18 million watts being transmitted. This was the main sign of our existence to the universe. Now this is, it says future digi digital stations because I made this slide before the transition happened. Now what we have is what you see here. And notice the power has gone down. The biggest power you see is a megawatt. We've gone from 18 megawatts to five megawatts. KQED went up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Is this some comment about public radio? 
uh, well, no, this was VHF, or were all lower power because the, the, they were easily more, the antennas were more sensitive. All right, so this is not a political thing. This is not a political thing. It's, uh, I think you'll see the equivalent of all these. What's KPIX here is 100 kilowatts over here. It's, well, it's actually bigger. Well, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Forget it <laughs> for a minute. Uh, <coughs> uh, part, of, part of that's because they're changing their coverage area <coughs> and stuff like that. But, uh, but on average, the transmitter towers have gone down a lot. And what's worse is that these are none of this is narrow band. The, the old TV signals had a very powerful narrow band signal. Half the power was in the narrow band signal. This has a wide signal that looks like noise. And again, it's a signal that we would not be sensitive to with our search systems. And so our, our signals, which are being designed to not require so much power, but also to be in a form which is um, carries information more e efficiently, are much more difficult to detect. Furthermore, we're being forced to share wavelength. There's only so much electromagnetic spectrum, so the spectrum has to be shared. And the prime example of that is the cell phone system, where hundreds and hundreds of people may be speaking on the same frequency at once. And uh, to make that work, you have to have low power on the transmitters and many, many towers. Otherwise, it d does overwhelm the system. Also, cell phones are, <coughs> uh, in many parts of the world, the only source of telephone systems now because they're e much easier to implement than something where you have to have wires or something all over the place. In many countries, third world countries particularly, the only telephone system is a cell phone system and even the less uh, wealthy people can afford them. And then, this is the worst news of all. This is the wave of the future here. This is the sort of satellite that sends television direct to homes on Earth, uh, <coughs> to 18-inch dishes on people's roofs. This is the Galaxy One. It's a typical satellite that's used for that purpose. It's about 10 meters across, about 30 feet across. As you see, it has many little antennas to send uh, television uh, programs to different parts of the Earth. In fact, this one provides radio, uh, television to both North and South America. And it does it in an extremely clever way. Uh, and at very low power. Instead of five megawatts, typical power in one of these C-band and KU-band are the those are, th those are uh, 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 <coughs> jargon for certain frequency bands, <coughs> about uh, 15 gigahertz. These are the bands that are used to send television to Earth. And look at the power, 20 watts, 75, 140. Not a million watts, 140. Mm -hmm. you know, so down <coughs> by 10,000 times fainter than what we had in the past. And all that power is being very cleverly on the Earth. This is the radiation pattern of Galaxy 11. <coughs> uh, on the, this is the North American beam. Uh, notice how it's tailored to feed Mexico, as it does. And Florida it even, it even has a little finger that points out to Puerto Rico. There's a finger for Hawaii. And <coughs> so this is an extremely marvelous case of electrical engineering. There is a second beam which feeds South America too, which isn't shown here. This is the North American beam. So we're sending 20 watts straight onto the Earth and almost all that's absorbed. The amount that goes back to space is maybe one or two watts. So instead of sending out millions of watts, we're now sending one or two. And I suspect that within 100 years or so, this is by the way all television will be delivered. It's just so efficient and so inexpensive. And we will turn off all those big towers with their megawatt transmitters. And the Earth will become very hard to find. And if that's <coughs> the way of the world, a way of worlds like ours, it means L. The L value may be only 100 years or so. And they'll still be there, just much harder to find. Now, what can we do about this? Can we make ourselves more sensitive? We can build bigger telescopes. This is one that's under construction, actually. It's uh, <coughs> being built by the Chinese. Uh, and it's to be a 500 meters in diameter compared to Arecibo's 300. Same basic design. 
uh, except that the entire surface is movable under computer control to make it into a parabolic shape instead of a spherical shape. And the energy collector is moved around by changing these cables. It's extremely challenging. I don't know if they can really do that. Uh, but it's under construction and supposedly will be finished in two years, which is really hard to believe. And I asked the director, how are you going to do it in two years? He says, easy. <laughs> <laughs> Since we can mobilize a million men, give them all shovels and have them go do it. <laughs> and they can. They, that's how the Three Gorges Dam was built. And they built that on schedule. So maybe we'll have this in operation in a few years. There's been efforts, suggestions that we should have a telescope on the far side of the moon. Good idea. It's the only place in the solar system that doesn't have the Earth in its sky at some time. And so it's immune to radio interference from the Earth. We even picked out the crater on the far side that would work right. And maybe in the future there will be something that creates a strong signal again to replace the ones that are quickly disappearing here. A prime example is solar power stations in space, which are now being seriously considered. One is actually under construction. And what one does is put solar panels, huge numbers of solar panels in space, and then use a big dish to transmit the collected energy to space as microwaves. And the proposed power levels are a billion watts, a gigawatt, which is typical of the ordinary coal-powered power, sta uh, power stations on Earth. Uh, and all antennas are imperfect. They reflect a little, a few percent. So it, this thing may send a billion watts to Earth, but a few percent are reflected in space, and that's 10 million watts. So again, a strong signal. So maybe this is what will save us and allow us to detect civilizations. And lastly, I'm about at the end here. This is, I'm just going to throw at you what I think is the ultimate technology that's going to change everything, which is the use of our sun as a lens. Now, how does that work? It works because gravity bends space. This is a result predicted by Einstein result of the theory of general relativity, the presence of a mass actually bends space. And that this actually happens was observed directly during a solar eclipse of in 1919, 19, 1915 and 1919, where the position of a star in the sky that was near the limb of the sun actually moved during the eclipse because the sun was bending space and deflecting the light rays. As you see here, the light rays that go close to the star are bent a lot. Well, it doesn't look like a lot, but it's a lot. Farther away, they're bent, but not as much. And the end result is the light rays are brought to a focus, and you create what is the most phenomenal telescope one can imagine. The sun acts just like a regular lens, except now your lens is over a million miles in diameter. Got a big hole in the middle because the sun blots out a lot of the light. But still, if you work out the numbers, <coughs> the total collecting area <coughs> of one of these gravitational lenses uh, is about equal to 30,000 Arecibo telescopes. That's at the radio wavelengths. It, it differs with, um, with um, the wavelength. So 30,000 Arecibo telescopes. A a resolution in the image is such that you can not only detect planets but photograph them in detail with these things and you can detect the presence of cities lights at night and all of that so uh, why aren't we doing that well a little problem the focal point <laughs> big challenge not a little problem big challenge the focal point the closest focal point is 550 astronomical units from the sun 14 times the distance to to uh, Pluto, uh, and you can't really, use the, these rays are interfered with by the atmosphere of the sun. You really have to go out probably to 700 AU before you get sharp images. Now, that means you have to put a spacecraft out there, and we don't have the capability of doing that. We need nuclear-powered spacecraft to do this, but you can predict that 100 years from now we will do this. And I would predict that every civilization does this because it is such a powerful instrument for studying the universe better than 
any optical or radio telescope you can imagine by a huge margin. I mean, you've, got a, you've got a lens a million, mi million miles in diameter <coughs> and you can use it uh, to capture radiation from distant objects. Here's the source. This is a sketch, of course. Here's the lens. It's a thick, thick ring focusing all the radiation to your spacecraft, which is 700 AUs from your star. Uh, <coughs> this would allow you to study the universe in incredible detail on any wavelength that you instrument this spacecraft for. This, by the way, is called the Einstein ring. You may see that if you read the literature. And it could be used as a communication link. Spacecraft at each end. This one shows us using one star as a lens, but you could use one at the star at each end. And if you work out the math for that, it's just incredible. The, it, you can almost hear a cell phone between two stars with two such lenses, each amplifying the signal by tens of thousands of times. And a few watts is all it takes to make a detectable signal between two stars. And if this is what civilizations do, and you can once you realize this is possible, as soon as we can get spacecraft out to this great distance and maneuver them around, it's what every civilization will do. And uh, in the end, <coughs> it means there's probably a galactic internet made by interconnections between gravitational lenses. All civilizations can learn about each other in this way. And uh, to me, this is the answer to the Fermi paradox. You can learn everything you want to about a civilization because you have such good communication, such good capability to capture data. You don't need to spend spacecraft at all, send spacecraft at all. You all do it this way. The problem is we're just not on the grid yet. We're not on the grid, but we're 100 years from now. You know, a blip in cosmic time will be on the grid. And there's probably tens of thousands that are on the grid right now waiting for us. And they're, you know, they're not all that anxious. They've got <laughs> plenty of <laughs> sources of information as it is. And people want to ask questions about your conception of what an alien would look like, and when are we going to find one, should we see contact, you know, should everyone run out and get it on Netflix this week? Anyone want to start? I'm sure there are lots. Go ahead. So, at the very beginning, you mentioned the, the whispers that came through the radio signals from Earth sources. I was wondering if there's any analogs that do that on an auditory level from the most from just phenomena in space that you've identified as not extraterrestrial, but also not uh, as a source. I don't think there's any auditory sound. Uh, 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 sound. Uh
neutron stars have their first focal point about a, as I recall, an AU from the star. They are imaging their whole planetary system. And I've always thought the, pulse, the pulsar observer should be looking for this. Because as the planets go around the neutron star, at some point, the neutron star will be actually imaging them in our direction. We should see see the presence of the planet. And how long has ever looked for that? It's probably in the data that people have discarded as trash. And the same deal with white dwarfs. The nearest focal distance is so close that they can image their own planets. Neutron stars <coughs> are stars that are 10 kilometers in diameter, so they're close, and they have the mass of the sun, so the bending is really great for the rays that pass close to them. Can you use a black hole for that? That's great too. Black holes do fine. Unlike the question, you talked about how the Earth's presence may be sort of disappearing because we're changing technology and all that. So maybe, as far as SETI is concerned, or maybe NASA, is there any sort of priority as far as kind of going to try to detect extraterrestrial signals versus trying to maybe intentionally put them out for detection? But That's a big subject right now. There's I sent a signal, but I don't believe we should send signals because it's better to use our resources to listen. I'll tell you why in a minute. But there is a lot of people now proposing that we should sort of have a moral obligation to send signals. If we're going to listen, we should be uh, uh, compensating or <coughs> rewarding people sending us by sending us. And so there are a lot of proposals to do what's called active setting, which is that we transmit. And we do more of things like the air signal message. Uh, the reason I don't think this is a good idea is first we're doing that, at least for a while, through our television broadcasts, tremendously copious. There's a cacophony of signals in the earth that somebody with a gravitational lens can easily pick up. Uh, the second reason is that sending is expensive. And I think it's better to put the resources, financial and otherwise, into the searching. Uh, there's a third reason given by people which I don't buy into because maybe it's because I'm an optimist. And that is that maybe it's dangerous. Uh, <laughs> the analog they put is that if you're in a jungle at night and you know there are dangerous creatures out there, it's best to be quiet, <laughs> very quiet. You don't shout in the jungle at night. Uh, and there's this idea that perhaps they, if they know of our existence, they will come and attack us for fear that we will do it to them. Uh, they, uh, there's a good, strong argument about nobody's ever going to attack anybody else, which is that energy argument that I gave you with the, the interstellar rockets and such. There's you know, no way another civilization can attack another without using resources far beyond any that would be acquired or preserved by making this attack. So I, I think. Space, in the way, quarantines us from one another, so we can't attack. So even if they are aggressive, they're not going to attack, even though we're shouting in the forest at night. Particularly since our shouts probably should be seen as friendly. Uh, so these are the reasons why uh, I don't think sending messages is a good idea, particularly as long as we are sending signals ourselves as we are. We're not already doing it free of charge. Uh, how long would it take to move a, um, a flight communication spaceship out to 700 AU? Well, with our, <clears throat> our present spacecraft, chemical rockets, uh, we now, our most distant spacecraft is 128 years out. It's a fifth of the way, and it has been traveling 30 years. So it's going to take another 150 years. 120 to 150 years to get to that distance, which it will. So that's not very appealing to people with 60 or 80 year lifetimes. Uh, so what I think to make this appealing to those who would fund such a project, you've got to figure out the propulsion system that can get you faster. Those have been on the drawing board for years. They're the nuclear rocket engines that have been designed, uh, ready to put together and test. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.